complexity. Have, have you ever tried to design a rocket yourself? Like, and launched it? So I made sugar rockets, and um, I built them. If by designing you mean like making a, like a computer file? No, I mean like like uh, building it out of like materials and going out and launching it. Yeah, so I have made some out of cardboard, of course, okay. and uh, tape. Those are the two things <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do, and. Um, it's difficult to say how high they fly because, of course, I, I can't put like um, a sensor on it. Yeah. Because they are things kind of like this, like this thick, this and yeah, yeah. high above like this. Okay. So there isn't like really space for um, like um, a chip, not a chip, um, a motherboard and some sensors. But like just guessing, I think I went over the 500 meters. That's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. What you could try is maybe get a Raspberry Pi hat. They are super small. Can still fit in your uh, model rocket, and uh, maybe put an infrared sensor just to check how far up you went, or put a tiny Pi camera, also super small, and uh, that would. With some image processing estimations, it could be possible. Yeah. I was thinking of using um, like a triang uh, uh, triangulation, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where if I have like this surface and I know the rocket went like this and I know this is like 30 meters, yeah. well, then I, uh, I can take a photo, for example, and I can uh, see the angle like from. Um, from here to the rocket, and yeah. uh, using some calculators that I found on Google, I can find how high the rocket went. Yeah, that's what that's what amateur rocketeers do when their sensors fail. <laughs> they take a look at the the footage of the video and they see which mountain they can see, and they're like, "Well, you can only see that mountain from about nine kilometers high, so we think we went to nine kilometers." <laughs> yeah. But but image processing in general is a really powerful tool. So um, it it sounds great that you're trying to do that because um, you don't need super sophisticated algorithms. Some of the greatest ideas are always simple ones. So definitely looking forward to at some point you may be showing us that you estimated the height. Of of course, I'm also really excited to help if you wanna yeah talk sometime about it. So how do you design your rockets? The key thing is to start with your requirements. Um, so what do we want to do? We want to build a rocket that goes to the Kármán line. So then from there, we work back to what do we need? What do we need in order to get that that goal? Um, they, so in rocketry, usually when you're designing a, a system, you want to figure out how much like delta V you need or how much impulse you need. And that's basically the amount of uh, energy that your rocket has to have in order to overcome the gravity and the aerodynamics to get to the destination. So from there, you can start thinking about, well, how big does the rocket have to be in order to achieve that? And that's kind of like the design part where you're just thinking about it in your mind. Um, and then from all, from all of that thought, you'll kind of come to a design a preliminary design where you're like, okay, well, I think that if we use this material and we use this fuel and we use this system that we'll get this far. Uh, then you have to start moving into the real world and say, okay, is it possible for me to build this structure <laughs> with this fuel <laughs> and this system and it, can I actually do that? So uh, we've gone through this loop a couple of times where we're like, okay, we want to do this and we think we can design, we've designed this thing. We go to the real world and we're like, oh shoot, that's actually not possible. <laughs> we've done something silly. And then we have to go back and say, okay, let's uh, go back to the real world. One example of this is uh, initially we were thinking of using uh, rivets to put our structure together. Uh, a rivet is like a, it's like a bolt, but it like, um, you can you can fasten it. You can put it in on one side, and then it like uh, there's a mechanism that causes it to 
like keep two pieces together. Oh, so like a knot, like a knot on the other side. Uh, it's like a self-forming knot. You don't need to do anything on the back to to make it. Like you 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 push it in, and then it like sucks out a piece. It like sucks out a piece of it, and it forms a secure thing on the back. Okay, how is it called? Uh, it's called a rivet. R i v e t. It's commonly used for things like uh, uh, like boats and stuff for putting structures together. It's really easy to use, and you just have this like rivet gun, and you just go boom, 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 and then you can fasten uh, things together. And we thought, oh, this is amazing. We'll just rivet the entire structure together. It's, it'll be super easy. Uh, but then we, f we figured out that, oh, uh, rivets are actually not uh, very waterproof or pressure proof. So <laughs> that won't work at all. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of how we have to we go through this process of uh, trying to figure stuff out. We also made uh, a little like model rocket thing that we took to the Space Tech Expo as more of an expose of showing what the whole thing will look like. But it was also it's also important to do little things like that to start thinking about the problems that you're going to have when you actually try to build the real thing. And one problem that we experienced when we built this little scale model was that uh, basically we 3D printed our bulkheads and we bought like these PVC uh, tubes that would be that were going to be like our um, carbon fiber structure. And when we tried to put them together, uh, of course we did all the math before and we said, okay, we, they need to be this wide and this big and everything. But when the machines actually made them, they were a little bit off. And so we tried to put them together, they didn't fit. <laughs> so then we had to sand them and like take modifications to make it so that they would fit. And that made us think like, okay, when we actually build these parts, we need to also be thinking about that. And we need to make sure that our tolerances for making sure that they're a certain width or a certain size are really precise and the way we expect them to be. Uh, and you can't, and of course you can know that beforehand, but you need to have experience. And so if you do a little small project by building like a little tiny model version, you can kind of learn about, okay, what are the problems that are going to be there with your design when you try to put things together. All prototyping starts with the design process. For this, we're using a program called Fusion 360, which is a freely available software for all students. Our plan is to 3D print the main components of our rocket, which include the upper bulkhead, the middle bulkhead, the nozzle, and the nose cone. These pieces will then be fit onto the combustion chamber and the oxidizer tank as they would be on the real rocket. We chose to 3D print these parts as they have complex geometries. For the real vehicle, we will actually not be able to do this because 3D printing aluminum is quite expensive. Instead, we'll probably end up CNC milling, which is a reductive process instead of the additive process, which 3D printing is. A 3D printer is basically the magic wand of engineering. What fuel and oxidizer do you want to use? Yeah, so we are going to be using paraffin wax for our fuel, and then we're going to use uh, nitrous oxide for oxidizer. And the reasons for this are that, uh, first of all, paraffin wax is a really nice material to try for fuel. It is easy to acquire. It's super cheap. Like, it's just candle wax, so you can get it, like, anywhere. It's also super easy to work with because you can just melt it, and pour it into things and you can cast any kind of shape. So that's nice. It also has a special property, which is that it burns really fast. So because it has a low melting temperature, um, instead of it like kind of uh, burning away where it goes right from a solid into a gas and mixes with the oxidizer, it actually kind of, there's a layer that forms on the surface of it where uh, there's like a liquid that's being injected right into the flame. And because it's going into the flame as a liquid, you can get way more of it into the flame at once than you can with other types of materials. And this means that you can get really high uh, pressures and really high thrusts, even if you uh, don't have that big of a system. So this is a really nice property, and that's why we chose it. For the nitrous oxide, uh, we chose that because it has a self-pressurization effect. So you, we don't need like an extra 
pressurization vessel with like helium or nitrogen that pushes the oxidizer into the combustion chamber, it'll actually just push itself into the combustion chamber uh, because of its properties with how it's stored at uh, 55 bar when it's in the oxidizer tank. And when it flows into the combustion chamber, it just kind of maintains the tank at 55 bar because of evaporation. Um, it's a bit complicated to think about, and it actually took me a little while to wrap my head around it. <laughs> this is something that I actually just learned about last year, so <laughs> when we were initially designing it. Um, so yeah, we'll see. We'll see how well it works uh, in in practice. Now that you've had your mind wrap around it, now trying to wrap some carbon fiber around it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. One problem that we are potentially anticipating is that uh, nitrous, nitrous oxide and CFRP have a history of not necessarily being super compatible. So, uh, yeah, we're definitely going to need to test our tank to make sure that it is uh, going to be able to handle the nitrous oxide. Mm -hmm. And also, we have to watch out for the aspect that all of the nitrous oxide stays in the gas state and not moving to liquid just for fun, just to mess with us and then condensing on the valves or something and causing issues like freezing stuff. This is um, also something we'll have to watch out for. You're always worried about the freezing on the valves. Uh... Yeah, it's only been three teams who complained of this. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Taha just wants to put uh, heaters onto the, onto, the, onto the tank. What could possibly go wrong with that now? <laughs> Heaters yeah. and rocket fuel. What could go wrong? Yeah, yeah. no problem at all. <laughs> I think the carbon fiber isn't really airtight, so I think we should use like some metal uh, something. Yeah, so that's that's a good point. Uh, some some uh, some groups have done basically an aluminum liner that you put into the tank. So basically, you create this aluminum uh, tank, and then you wrap the carbon fiber around the aluminum tank, and that makes your tank. Um, the lab that we're going to be building the CFRP tubes at actually has some experience with building uh, pressure vessels that are only CFRP. So we're kind of relying a little bit on their experience with that technique to inform the design of our tank, which will also try to be just the CFRP uh, piece in the middle. Um, and they, the, uh, the place that we've been doing this with is called the Fazer Institute, and they actually have made pressure vessels that contain helium that are just CFRP. Uh, so we are, because of that experience, we're a little bit confident that we'll be able to do it. Of course, it's always subject to testing, so we'll see what actually happens. In the do you plan to use thrust vectoring? Oh, man. Uh, our, yeah, th this is definitely beyond our capabilities at this point, I would say. <laughs> um, to thrust vector a 24 kilonewton engine is quite a challenge. Uh, I don't know how to, to imagine this. Have you ever, uh, I don't know, have you ever seen like a fire hose or something? Like for a fireman when they have the big no, hose? No, but I, I know, I know how it works. Yeah, well, anyways, if you've ever watched them try to handle it, they basically need like three guys holding on to point this thing because of all the force that is made when the water comes out. Um, so if you think about like how much like power you need to push and pull on a rocket that's shooting out at 24 kilonewtons, which is way more than that fire hose, uh, yeah, there's like a lot of mechanical muscle that you need to do that. And it has to be precise too. And so being precise, precise and powerful, uh, that's that's a challenge. Do you use the trapezoidal fins? And if yes, why? No, why? Oh, we're really getting into the weeds now. Yes, we do use trapezoid fins. <laughs> uh, the reason why we use them is uh, well, first of all, they're they're really good for. Uh, traveling at Mach speed. So usually when you have like a, a wing or something like that, like the classical wing shape, that is really good for when you're going below the speed of sound. When you go above the speed of sound, there's lots of like shock stuff that, that forms on that wing surface and it creates some complicated airflows and you get weird stuff that happens with like flow separation and stuff. 
and then and we want to stay away from that because you get like yeah into weird stuff uh the trapezoid fin is nice because you have like this sharp point that is going forward into the airstream and that is going to be something that works really well for getting through the sonic boundary and also when you get into the hypersonic regime it's good for the uh for the drag coefficient that the wing that the fin has the next point about the trapezoid fin is that we're actually planning right now temporarily testing phase to have an asymmetrical trapezoid and the reason for that is that we want to actually use that to create lift on the fin so that we can produce spin uh, this is one theory that we have for how we can get the vehicle to spin so that we get the spin stabilization we might choose to, to abandon that later on after we do the subscale test if we find out it doesn't work very well and go with uh, actually just angling the fins to create the spin but we'll we'll see which uh strategy is more effective do you use uh, PCBs for your rockets? Um, yeah, this is a really debated topic um, with the aspect of um, how much we should have a trade-off between um, existing components and making custom boards because custom boards are always subject to conditions that they didn't have before because of which they might fail. You might have wires coming off. You might have connections not uh, staying stable. Um, however, um, the idea is to use, um, at this point, we are testing out different routes. One idea is what I mentioned about the Raspberry Pi. Uh, so Raspberry Pi hat is another, um, kind of daughter board that you can at attach on top of the normal Pi that you always have. And the cool part is that it has, um, a sensor for height, um, pressure, uh, and IMU all on, all as part of it. Um, another aspect to also keep in mind is uh, the battery system we have because we want it to stay alive to the point where there might be delays while filling and uh, the onboard computers shouldn't die with this time. Uh, we also need it to be um, functional to the point of the end of the flight and also to the point where we go and find the beacon and recover the avionics. So um, battery is a concern that we want to think about. Um, of course, the prime objective of ours is to find if we the 103 kilometer mark, the altitude, and anything else we can get other than that is really like a bonus on the way. So we do plan to have a camera. We do plan to have IMU sensors. We plan to record the altitude in more than just one way. Um, we also want to make sure that we have um, a good way to lock with the GPS um, coordinates to ensure that we've reached the right altitude. Um, so yeah, we are testing different possibilities. We definitely have the idea of having our own custom printed circuit board, but we also want to check the Raspberry Pi hat that I mentioned. And um, the main idea to keep in mind is actually um, the trade-off between computational power and the complexity of the algorithm that's running on it. So we want to really keep the design simple so that we give as much power as possible for the sake of um, tolerance until we find and recover the avionics. How do you want to recover your rockets? The main idea is, of course, to have uh, the draw parachute deploy and then the main parachute and um, eventually to have a beacon that helps us locate the avionics system for us to go um, recover it. Um, ensuring that the parachute's not getting tangled together um, I'm not sure I have an answer to that. Uh, um. uh, well, the, the two parachutes are stored separately, so they shouldn't become tangled uh, in any way. The fir first, the drogue will get deployed. It's on the upper part of the recovery bay. So it'll get kind of shot out uh, into the airstream. And there's like a system that keeps it so that only it is deployed Well, in that, in that phase. And then we have a, a pyrotechnic charge that's going to fire, that's going to release a pin that's going to pull out uh, a cord that's connected to the main chute. And that the, jokes, the, the drag that's on the drogue chute will essentially pull out the main chute. So uh, I don't really foresee that they will get tangled. What could happen, though, is that the lines themselves 
the lines that connect the the bay to the parachute that could become tangled on something as it comes out of the parachute bag or something like that and that's why we need to test uh the deployment and how that works and why a drop test is really the best thing because that's putting it in its natural environment and seeing what will happen uh one concern i do have though is if the nose cone is not in the nose down configuration it could be challenging to have the parachute come out without like the nose cone flying into the parachute <laughs> like if it deploys upside down yeah that that could be a problem but of course we plan to add some dummy weight or ensure that uh, avionics has redundancy so like instead of one pressure sensor you have two to make sure that if this fails the other one works so by adding a bit of redundancy or some weight in the nose cone i think um, it would be a good way to um, make sure that it is pointing nose down when it's landing yeah but having a perfect recovery is probably the hardest thing of the rocket i would say yeah, it's always the, the part where amateurs get, uh, I, I would say, that have the, the, the greatest difficulty in terms of making it work properly. There's just a lot of variables when it's coming down <laughs> to deal with. Do you plan to use abricks? Uh, well, I know this is a part of how Yurok rockets usually are designed because they want to get a precise altitude. So obviously when you make a propulsion system, Sometimes it's a little too powerful. I usually want to go on the side of too powerful, so you're for sure going to get to the target. But then when you're, as you're flying, you may want to adjust quickly, maybe have some more drag to slow you down so you'll get right to the perfectly to the target. And that's when these air brakes work really well. Uh, but of course, for our rocket, we're just trying to go as high as possible. So <laughs> no need for ascent air brakes or anything. We could use them on the way down, but we, we actually were briefly considering them as a way to slow down the nose cone instead of the drogue chute. Uh, but in the end, it turned out to be more mechanically complicated than just having a drogue chute. So yeah, briefly considered, but then thrown away. What's your payload? Oh man, we wish we had a payload. If anyone wants to ride with us, let us know. <laughs> We don't really have an official scientific payload yet. Uh, we have Obviously, we have our sensors that are going to go up and take data, which will be interesting and useful because, um, yeah, I, I guess not a lot of student rockets have done that. And at least the data will be useful if someone wants to ride on us, ride on a rocket like that in the future, because then we have a bunch of data that says, well, this is what it's like to ride on it. So this is what your payload has to be able to withstand. It's quite a violent ride, though. Like, it's... The, the rocket will experience, I think, 16 or 17 Gs is the latest simulation we had uh, of force <laughs> on, when, it, when it lifts off. So, uh, yeah, that's quite extreme. Yeah, so nothing to extreme test something before. Yeah. Nothing sensitive on, the, on our rocket, for sure. Yeah. 